This is the Smart Buildings Academy podcast with Phil Zito, episode 412. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and welcome to episode 412 of the Smart Buildings Academy podcast. In this episode, we are going to be going through BACnet objects. We're going to be doing a deep dive on BACnet objects. And the reason we're doing this is I still find through our courses in the course forums, uh, on our skill assessments, as well as just conversations with folks, that they struggle with understanding BACnet specifically to integration. Uh, so this is going to be one of two parts where we're going to be going through BACnet uh, at the object level, talking about the objects, properties, and services. And then we're going to be in another episode talking about integration. We're going to be looking at object lists now that you have that foundational information and talking about how do we make integrations easy. By the end of these two episodes, you should be able to look at any BACnet points list, understand what you're looking at, understand the capabilities of those objects and their properties and their services, and it should make going and doing integration a whole lot easier. As always, as we move through this, just feel free to ask any questions in the chat. This is live and interactive. Uh, everything will be available at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 412. And if you're listening to this, uh, go there and you'll be able to watch the video. I do want to say the wife is in Japan this week and the kids are out from spring break. So there could possibly be uh, screaming, dogs barking, you know, sky falling, all that fun stuff. But uh, we'll try to get through it without too many distractions. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pop something on the screen. This is from our learning management system. This is a video I recorded back when I had hair. And uh, what I want to pull out of this video right here is the common objects. Now, this is not all the objects in the ASHRAE 135 standard. By any means, there's a whole lot more as far as objects. And quite honestly, even in these objects, uh, some of these you're not necessarily going to use all the time. I do want to point out, however, a couple key objects. And I want to talk about what ultimately an object is, because this is what throws a lot of people, uh, is that we have objects and then objects can have objects. So if we think about BACnet, uh, the most common object we think about in the BACnet world is the object that is known as the BACnet device. Now, the BACnet device object, right, has a list of objects underneath it typically that can be instantiated. Uh, some of those are things like analog inputs, binary outputs, trend logs, schedules, binary values, etc. And we'll talk through these objects in greater detail a little bit later. But what happens when you discover a device using the who is I am service, you go and you initiate this broadcast that gets sent to all the BACnet devices on a subnet or a series of subnets if you're using a BBMD and a BDT. Uh, that's a BACnet broadcast management device. And the BDT is the BACnet distribution table uh, or BBMD distribution. I always get the acronym mixed up. Essentially, it's a list of BACnet networks that broadcast messages should be forwarded to by the BBMD. It's how we manage to kind of bypass the subnet filtering of broadcasts because broadcasts uh, can only travel across their broadcast domain, which is on a single subnet, right? A single subnet has a single broadcast domain. So what happens is you send out this who is uh, I am message. The who is comes from the discovering device. The I am is a unicast return message to that broadcasting device. So the who is is a broadcast. The I am is a unicast. That unicast goes to whatever device was discovering and it starts to build out a list of back nodes. It's a list object or an array object, typically a list object. Uh, and it builds out a list of back nodes, and this is where we start to get our addresses, um, which is the device ID plus you know, either the IP address in the case of BACnet uh, IP or the MAC address in the case of MSTP. So you do this discovery, you get these device lists, and then you instantiate another service, you, you execute another service, which is called the 
uh, Who Has I Have, and that is the discovery of objects. This is where you start to build your object array under your device. With me so far, we go and we discover our BACnet devices. Those BACnet devices each have a unique address, which is device ID plus IP address or device ID plus uh, MAC address. Once we get those unique addresses, we put them onto a list of back nodes, that's our devices, and then each device can have a list of BACnet objects. All right, so the BACnet objects, they have a list of properties. And what you'll notice with properties is that you're gonna have required properties and optional properties. So required properties are properties that are required by the BACnet 135 standard, and uh, if you want to get BTL listing, you're going to have to meet these for the objects. So input, and we're going to do inputs and outputs, and we're going to see that inputs have present value. This is the sensed value of the input. Out of service, that's if you put the input out of service. Units, what are the units and any status flags? And then we have optional description and reliability. This is why Sometimes going and pulling BACnet systems can be such a pain in the butt because what will happen, and there's other required properties in here as well. There's there's common properties for any object. Um, I think I got them in the slide here. Object identifier, object name, and object type. Just in case some of you are like, that's not the only ones, Phil. I, I know that's not the only ones. Uh, I'm just showing you the ones that are specific to inputs. Assume that the other ones I showed you just a second ago are across every object. But right here, specific to inputs, we have present value, out of service, unit, status flags, and we have description and reliability as optionals. Uh, this is what causes a lot of problems when you do a analytics project and you go to discover BACnet, you actually have a lot of people who do not fill out the description prog um, property because it's not required. So you really struggle to try to figure out what it is you're discovering. Now we're going to fast forward and we're going to see some outputs. And this is true of values as well. So analog values, binary values, multi-state values. Uh, so an output would be an analog, binary output, you know, et cetera. We see present value out of service unit status flags. And then we see these two unique properties, the priority array and relinquish default. So the priority array is a unique property for BACnet objects and values. And the first thing I tend to see when people do integration is they grab analog inputs or they grab an, uh, binary inputs. And they wonder why they can't write to these points. That's because these points do not have a priority array. So technically in BACnet world, your outputs should truly be outputs. While you can write to the priority array of an output, that really should be written to by the program, not by the user, unless you know, you're overwriting an output or something. What you want to do if you have set points, and this isn't a hard and fast rule, but if you have set points, you want those to be values, like analog values. So when you go to discover that chiller, that air handler, and map in those points, and you map in an AI for discharge air temp uh, set point, that may be a read-only value because it has no priority array. So you can command that all freaking day long and nothing's going to happen because you don't have a priority array. Um, with the priority array, that adds the ability to go and do the commanding. So we want to make sure when we're discovering points, we're mapping in outputs or values. And we also see this little thing called relinquish default. Relinquish default quite simply is the fallback value for the priority array when a uh, priority array, array gets wiped or something gets reset. This is in persistent memory typically, and it's you know where we'll put our default set points and things like that. Then we move on to services, okay? And services are quite important. And we have this client server dynamic in BACnet. And this is kind of weird because 
if you think about the word server, you associate it with service. Uh, and if you think of the word server, you tend to associate it with BAS server. First off, the association with service is good. The association with a BAS server is completely incorrect. A application, no, let's not use that example. An advanced application controller sitting in your air handler can be a server from the perspective of service, just like a um, temperature sensor could potentially be a server in the concept of service. So when you do a read property service request from your BAS front end and you request a refresh of a property or you do a write property service from your BAS front end, that is the client and it is initiating the service at the device. So the device, the BAS controller, the BAS temperature sensor, whatever, is the server that then executes that service and returns that value to the client. Hence, the executor is responsible for response data. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So if we keep on going here, there's two types of services. Um, that objects. And if you're wondering like what specific uh, service does each object do? Uh, how does this all work? You definitely purchase the ASHRAE 135 standard and go through it. Um, that's how I taught myself. You can go through our BAS protocol bootcamp course. Uh, that works as well. So the unconfirmed services are fire and forget. Um, these are not acknowledged. Now, a lot of people, when they see BACnet um, IP and they see that it's UDP, they start to think to themselves this user datagram protocol. It's an unreliable um, protocol. It does not have confirmation like TCP transmission con uh, control protocol. So how does this all work? It's beyond the scope of this episode, but suffice to say, there's um, basically BACnet virtual links that are created. Um, that enable the service to do certain functionality. All right, so we've got our unconfirmed services. These are fire and forget. And then we've got our confirmed services. There are simple and complex acknowledgements. So we'll dive into that. Complex acknowledgements, this is a read property, right? Uh, we're going to go and do a complex acknowledgement of a... Um, service that is a confirmed service, so read property. And that would do a unicast message or a directed message, depends if you're IP or MSTP, from the client to the device, to the server, and the server executes the read property and it returns it with the requested data. So that's a complex acknowledgement. A uh, simple acknowledgement would be like a command um sometimes commands can be simple acknowledgments it just depends on how it's implemented so if we go we'll see we get some alarm and event services we're going to kind of skip over those we're going to skip over cov object access stuff uh remote data and we're going to go to this nifty difty drawing let me see if i got one here i wanted to show you all this I haven't looked at this video in a while. Ah, here it is. Read property. I guess write is a complex acknowledge. So read write property goes to our controller, the executor, and it gives the response to the UI. Uh, pretty straightforward how it all works. If you want, you can actually go and uh, let me set this to 1080p real quick. You can actually go and get the yet another backnet explorer source code you can actually dig in and see how this like if you want to get super geeky into all of this you can actually see how all this works but when it comes to it at the end of the day objects are the core of backnet backnet is an object oriented protocol objects are defined by having certain properties and supporting certain services. 
So at the end of the day, if you're having trouble with a BACnet integration, you're having trouble with a BACnet system, and you've checked the IP and MSTP settings, you made sure you have unique device IDs, you've made sure that you know, your baud rates are the same, et cetera, et cetera, then it may come down to you not having discovered the proper objects, and you may not be working with objects that support the required properties. So that being said, let's go quickly and check our uh, chat features since they don't pop up for whatever reason in the software. I'm going to go and bring them up actually in here and take a look. So give me one second. So I'm going to step into here real quick, see what we got. All right, nothing on LinkedIn, nothing on Facebook, and no questions on YouTube. All right, so I'll give you all uh, about 30 to 45 seconds to ask whatever questions you may have. As I mentioned, this will be available at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 412. I did not want to make this a super long podcast because, quite frankly, that's about as deep as you need to go for most of you. Um, that's probably deeper than most of you need to go. But uh, I wanted to give you kind of a better understanding of BACnet objects, how they work. My hope is that you have a better understanding now and that you should feel more comfortable looking at BACnet systems and figuring out, oh, this makes sense because this is this type of object. Uh, so let me see. Good to go. All right. So I'm going to get back to making sure my children do not burn down the house and that they actually eat their lunches and do all the other stuff a responsible parent should be doing. Wish me luck. Wife's gonna be gone the whole week, so it's gonna be a little crazy. But uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. On Wednesday, we're gonna have a guest, and on Friday, we're gonna have a guest. So thank you so much. Uh, it's been a little fluid with getting the cyber series and the estimating series done. Uh, it's just been really crazy with, you know, going through a small business program right now, as well as just trying to get a bunch of things that you'll hear about this summer that we got going on. Um, you'll hear about them, but I uh, can't kind of tell you right now, but you'll see them on LinkedIn. I'm sure you'll see people and companies sharing them. You're welcome, Todd. Thank you. And uh, with that being said, I'm going to end this now. And if you have any questions after the fact, do not hesitate to reach out on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, wherever. Feel free to ask us any questions. I will answer them.